On August 11, 1994, Tony Gwynn was hitting nearly 400, Matt Williams and Ken Griffey Jr. were chasing the home run record, and the Montreal Expos held the best record in baseball. But the next MLB game wouldn't be played until April 25th of the next year, and most of you know why. With the current collective bargaining agreement expiring, I wanted to take a look back at the last time games were missed because of a strike. The 1994 season was extraordinary before it was cut short, and I'm going to explore a few storylines that were left hanging. But first, my last couple of videos have done really well, and if you're new here, you're probably not subscribed. Subscribing is free and it helps me out a ton. So if you like my videos, hit that subscribe button. Now let's get into it, starting off with Tony Gwynn's incredible season. Simply put, Tony Gwynn was a baseball deity. After his 54 game rookie year, his lowest batting average in the next 19 seasons was 309. In his career, he struck out about once every 6 games. This dude struck out once a week. Despite only homering 135 times in his career, he drew over 200 intentional walks. He's 17th all-time in intentional walks above sluggers like Jim Tomei, Frank Thomas, and Sammy Sosa, but he's tied with Luke Scott with the 651st most homers. Barry Bonds was walked and intentionally walked more than anyone else, but he had less intentional walks per strikeout than Gwynn, and 1994 was Gwynn's magnum opus. Now in his mid-30s, he was no longer a gold glove outfielder or a base stealing threat, but nobody could get him out. He absolutely killed Cy Young vote-getters and only struck out twice in 40 plate appearances against them. This graph is his game-by-game -game rolling average throughout the season. After bottoming out with a 300 average on April 15th, he collected 3 hits off of Cy Young runner-up Ken Hill on the 21st, 5 hits off the Phillies on the 23rd, and 2 more hits and a hit-by-pitch off of Kurt Schilling the very next day. He was hitting 395 at month's end. May was kind of a down month for him since he didn't have a single 4 hit game and his average fell to a paltry 393 by the end, although he did have 3 straight 3 hit games from the 11th to the 14th. He had a 4 hit game on June 11th in San Francisco and finished the month with a 391 average. You get the idea, this season wasn't propped up by one huge month or hot streak. July was his worst month by a good margin and he still hit 370 with a 954 OPS. He reached base 7 times and had a sack fly in 10 plate appearances during a doubleheader in Philly on the 22nd. Entering August, he was still hitting 385, and the possibility of a 400 season was now on everyone's minds. With the Padres season already a lost cause, people were going to the ballpark solely to watch Tony. He entered August on a 5 game hit streak, and outside of a hitless pinch hit appearance on the 4th, he collected a hit during every game for the rest of the year. Out of his 9 August starts, he had 7 multi hit games and 3 3 hit games. Another fun fact about this year is that he only struck out 19 times and only had one multi strikeout game, in which he homered anyway. Had 3 more grounders gone through the hole or 3 more fly balls blooped in for base hits, he would have been the first 400 hitter since Ted Williams. I don't think anyone will ever get this close to 400 again with the way defense and pitching have been become optimized. This could have been our last shot. Who knows if his August hot stretch was coming to a close or just a sign of things to come, but the strike ensured that we'll never know how close he would have been. Roger Maris' home run record of 61 had stood for over three decades entering the 1994 season. Only three had even reached 50 homers during that time span. But by the summer of 94, two sluggers were homing in on the record. Ken Griffey Jr. was a bona fide superstar. At just 24 years old, he was coming off four consecutive gold gloves and silver sluggers in center field, and he was the new young face of baseball. He had only gotten better since entering the league, and it looked like he'd stepped up his game yet again entering 1994. He started off the year by slugging 7 homers in April with an OPS above 1000, but he was just getting started, and he kicked it up to a whole new level in May, slugging 15 homers with a 1244 OPS. He never went more than 3 games without homering during the month. At the end of May into early June, he went a week without homering, but then he homered 10 more times in his next 18 games, bringing his total to 32 by June 24th. He was on pace to hit 72, but this homer monsoon was quickly followed by a drought, during which he hit just 4 more through the end of July. Two long road trips and the all-star break took a lot of wind out of his sails. As he clawed his way towards 40, another emerged on the chase. A man from the bay, Matt Williams. Matt the Bat started off his season with a bang, homering twice on opening day. 
For most of the season, he had Barry Bonds as his protection in the lineup, meaning that he would see more strikes than most sluggers. And he took full advantage, homering 10 times in April, 9 times in May, 10 times in June, and 11 in July. On July 24th, he tied Griffey with 36 bombs and was on pace for 61 on the year. Entering August 1st, Griffey was on pace for 58 and Williams was on pace for a whopping 63. Matt and Barry were keeping the Giants afloat in the race for the NL West. Although they lost their first six games of August, Williams hit a three-run shot for his 43rd homer on August 10th to help sweep the Cubs in Wrigley. He was now on pace for 61. Entering the month, Griffey's Mariners were 40-62, and 62, 22 games below 500, but just eight and a half games out of the lead of the historically bad AL West. And Junior was about to get hot. In their first 10 games of August, the M's went 9-1 and, and Griffey homered four times. They were now just two games behind Texas, and with the homestand on the horizon and Griffey heating up, anything was possible. But we never got to see this storyline's final act. The notoriously streaky Griffey could have hit 25 more homers in the preceding 7 weeks for all we know, or Williams could have kept pace and broken the record. He was consistently on pace pretty much all year, never going more than 6 games without a homer. It's impossible to know what would have happened next. But before the strike, Junior went out with a bang. Change. The Expos and Yankees led the National League and American League, respectively, on August 11th, 1994. The once great Yankees were looking to reclaim their throne, and the Expos were looking for their first World Series title. Ironically, neither team had made the playoffs since the last strike-shortened season in 1981. That was actually the only time the Expos ever made the playoffs. But this team was different. They were managed by the legendary Felipe Alou and led by his son Moises, who was in the midst of a true breakout season. Larry Walker was the team's other star, and he was having his best year yet. Marquise Grissom, Cliff Floyd, and Rondell White were other notable young bats in their lineup. Their rotation was led by aforementioned Cy Young runner-up Ken Hill and a young Pedro Martinez, and John Wetland and Mel Rojas combined for 41 saves out of the bullpen. This team was great in every facet of the game, finishing third in the NL in runs scored in OPS, first in stolen bases, first in ERA, and top five in most important stats. Most of their best hitters were also great in the field. Right after the All-Star break, they lost four straight games to drop their record to 54-37, and two games out of the division lead. They then went on to win eight in a row, lose one, win six in a row, lose another, and win six more in a row. By the end of their 20-2 stretch, they were seven games above Atlanta for the division lead and now looking to run away with the best record in baseball. Did I mention they did all of this with the second lowest payroll in the league? This was a young team with a promising future, but after August 11th, this young core would never play together again. The revenue loss because of the strike caused ownership to slash payroll, including letting Walker walk and trading Grissom and Hill. This was the Expos' last real chance to ever make the playoffs since they never had the resources to build another team quite like this. It really is a microcosm of the Montreal years in general. So many talented players and even future Hall of Famers, but no playoff success. The Yankees, of course, are just about the opposite of that. They are in the midst of their worst playoff drought since they traded for Babe Ruth, but they look to be building their first contender since the early 80s. Captain Don Mattingly hadn't made the playoffs once in his career, but his bat was supplemented with those of Wade Boggs, Paul O'Neill, and Bernie Williams in recent years. The lineup was now amongst the best in baseball, finishing the shortened season with the highest OPS and second most runs scored in the AL. They got off to a blistering 32-13 start, thanks to a monstrous first two months from O'Neill. From the end of this stretch until the All-Star break, they were just okay. But they came out of the break hot, winning 19 of 22. While they cooled off just before the strike, this may have been the first iteration of the dynasty that was brewing. And manager Buck Showalter may have had a legitimate shot at a ring. The Expos franchise finally won its first World Series in 2019, albeit under a new name and in a new city. We were deprived of the 1994 Juggernaut Expos playoff run, and Donnie Baseball had to wait one more year to make his mark in the playoffs. And when that time came, he was ready. This one by Mattingly! Oh, hang on to the roof! Goodbye, home run! Don Mattingly! With the lockout still going and no compromise in sight, I just hope we don't have another 1994 on the horizon. If you want to learn more about the actual details of the 1994 strike, CBA negotiations, and fan reaction, my friend The Diamond is putting out a video about it soon. I'll add a card once it's out. And once again, subscribing helps me out a ton, so if you like this please subscribe and leave a like. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in my next video.